Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. And I'm Jean Marie. And I am Ron. Collectively, we are the hosts of Podcast DX. Welcome to this special edition of Podcast DX. Although I will not be able to participate in the taping later today, I wanted to take a moment to introduce today's guest and our topic. Today marks the 17th year since the United States was attacked by terrorists hijacking four commercial jets which crashed into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York, the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia, and a field outside of Shanksville, Pennsylvania. According to the New York City Fire Department, 2,977 victims were killed in the September 11 attacks. 412 were emergency workers in New York City who responded to the World Trade Center. This included 343 firefighters of the New York City Fire Department, including a chaplain and two paramedics. What you may not realize is there are still victims dying today from the aftermath of working in the environment of the disaster and subsequent cleanup. As of today's taping, the death toll of firefighters that have succumbed to injuries or illnesses related to the disaster has unfortunately reached 178. We have the honor of speaking today with Dr. David Prezant. Uh, Dr. Prezant is a board-certified pulmonologist and internist. As the chief medical officer for the New York City Fire Department, he and his colleague created a monitoring and treatment program for first responders and residents in the aftermath of 9-11. Dr. Prezant, we're very honored to have you on our show today as we remember the brave men and women who gave their lives on this day 17 years ago. Well, thank you. It's an absolute honor and, and pleasure to be invited to talk to you and your listeners today. Uh, 9-11 is a day that we will always remember in the fire department, but it's also important that we share those memories with everyone uh, so that they can realize uh, what a, a true bunch of heroes these men and women were. Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, from what I've read, um, pulmonologists treat ailments of the lungs and respiratory system, such as maybe asthma, pneumonia, tuberculosis, COPD, and other complex um, chest infections and things of that nature. But I'd like to start us out by asking you actually two questions. What made you decide to become a pulmonologist? And how did you come to work with and for the New York City Fire Department? Oh, that was a great question. Uh, rarely am I asked, so uh, thank you. Uh, I've always been interested in the lungs. Uh, sure. If you talk to any uh, physician who specializes, uh, you know, they always think their organ system is the most interesting and the most important. Uh, but they're wrong. The lungs are the most <laughs> interesting <laughs> and the most important. Uh, the lungs are, are what gets oxygen everywhere. Uh, muscles, heart, kidneys, brain. They don't survive without the lungs. Right. right. And, and the other really fascinating thing to me was the, the wide spectrum of diseases and ages that, of patients that are involved in, in lung treatment. And then most importantly, uh, it has a connection not just to patients, but to uh, the occupational and environmental health field so that you can help through medicine and public health initiatives. Pulmonologists are able to prevent disease and able right. to interact with people who are exposed uh, who have true uh, serious concerns. Right, and right. if you're interested in preventing disease and uh, dealing with occupational and environmental exposures, there's really no better place to do that work than with the greatest fire department in the world, the fire department of the city of New York. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Prezant, we've read your articles regarding the September 11th attacks and the effects of the World Trade Center complex fires. For our listeners, could you briefly summarize what the long-term effects of working in those extreme conditions are? Well, we're finding out new things every day. Uh, it's 17 years after 9-11, and we're still finding out new things. Initially, uh, this was felt to be an upper and lower airway insult 
uh, causing uh, sinusitis, which is nasal congestion, right. nasal and sinus tenderness, headaches, uh, and lower airway issues, predominantly asthma and bronchitis. Okay. Uh, over time, we learned that everything we were inhaling, the various different toxic dust made up of chemicals of combustion and chemicals of jet fuel and building materials that were uh, pulverized and therefore inhalable. Over time, we learned that inhaling all of that uh, was not the only thing we did. We actually were swallowing oh. uh, parts of it as well, sure. which led to a variety of uh, stomach ailments, most notably uh, acid reflux, okay. sometimes called gastroesophageal reflux disorder. And the very interesting aspect of that is that these three diseases, sinusitis, asthmatic bronchitis, and acid reflux, these three diseases can fuel each other. It's often called the one airway uh, paradox, where if you have a sinus drip, it worsens your right. asthma. Okay. Oh, if you have I acid see. reflux, yeah. you see, you're inhaling that acid reflux as it comes up, oh. and that worsens your asthma. So you have to treat all three conditions okay. sure. to get improvement. Okay. And that was a major advance uh, in our knowledge and in our treatment. In addition to that, uh, right away, we realized and we found a variety of mental health issues oh, yeah. because of the body parts and the stress that uh, these first responders were under. Uh, in addition to the physical health issues, we, we found a variety of mental health issues because of the stress and the various exposures to bodies and body parts that our first responders uh, were subject to. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to losing 343 of their own co-workers, firefighters, uh, a chaplain, and, and two paramedics. So this was an immense emotional burden as well. Uh, this is a family, and to lose family members uh, really brings it all home. Uh, so we were uh, knowing and, as expected, uh, needed to uh, rev up to treat uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, and uh, depression. Now, over time, because you asked about the long-term effects, over time, in addition to all of those issues, uh, there's been a lot more depression that's occurred with uh, retirement uh, and uh, with sort of a loss of purpose, with disability, with dealing with physical health issues that take uh, really uh, amazing, physically capable people who are firefighters and, and turn them into normal people or, right, or, right. or, or even more disabled than that. Taking, uh, that, the, taking the capes stop. off of the superheroes. Yeah, they're, they you got it. That, that's so well said. And, and you know, that, that has added more emotional stress. And then there's the long-term chronic illnesses that have added on, which we were, again, at the fire department the first to document, which are the cancers of, of all types, but predominantly hematologic cancers, prostate cancer, colon cancer. It's a little too early to have seen lung cancer, uh, that usually takes about 20 uh, years to develop, but we are now starting to see that. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we were also the first to show that uh, there's been a host of autoimmune diseases oh. that have been uh, associated with the World Trade Center. Okay. Sarcoidosis is the predominant mm -hmm. one, uh, but we have some evidence that other rheumatologic autoimmune diseases uh, are, are also associated with this exposure. Uh, so... By identifying these problems, we are able to get uh, early treatment, early diagnosis, and then early treatment. Uh, so in addition uh, to these uh, diseases uh, and others that we're now looking into, the, the critical issue is that with early diagnosis, early treatment, which can only be done when you have knowledge that these diseases are cropping up, with early diagnosis, you achieve early treatment and, and better outcomes. And the World Trade Center Health Program, for those diseases that are covered under the health program, uh, provides uh, free treatment. And by doing this, we're, we're really we're doing something even more important than just treating disease. What we're doing is we're fulfilling our ethical and moral covenant with everyone that ran into those buildings 
that day with everyone that was exposed during the very intense rescue recovery effort over the next six to ten months. Uh, we're, we're fulfilling a very important covenant where we said to these people, you come help us and we will be there to help you. And it's been immensely fulfilling both as a physician, uh, but also uh, knowing these, these great men and women and being able to give back something to them. That's wonderful. Yes. Yeah, I think we can all appreciate that. Um, Dr. Prezant, as we've been looking through photos online as 9-11, um, the anniversary of these horrific attacks and the aftermath comes back into play, uh, we couldn't help but notice how many of the first responders um, were not wearing breathing protection at the, you know, when they, the photos were taken. And we can't imagine the overwhelming task that they had in front of them. And it may not have always been on anyone's mind or even possible at the time for these first responders to wear respirators during their arduous task of um, recovery and all of the work that they had to do. But do you believe that maybe um, in future, not, not hopefully never anything of this nature, but in um, when first responders are undertaking their tasks, if at all possible, should they be wearing respirators or would that not have even helped or assisted um, with their long-term health? Well, uh, we, we would have much better health outcomes if we were all wearing respirators and complete uh, personal protective equipment. I mean, one can even take this uh, to the extreme of saying that in a severely toxic exposure, we should all be in the equivalent space. Okay. The problem is uh, being able to do your work at right. the same time. Right. Okay. Uh, these are very difficult uh, to breathe through, uh, they also uh, reduce communication. Right. Uh, and communication between workers uh, during uh, and in a hazardous environment is very critical. I mean, nobody ever talks about this, but we had no life-threatening traumatic injuries during the 10 months of the rescue recovery effort. Okay. Uh, this is while working and digging and right. uh, moving through rubble well, and marvelous. steel beams. Yeah. You know, we had none, right. and that's in part because of uh, the supervision, but also in part because people are able to communicate back and forth okay. while they're doing this. Sure. Now, that's not a full excuse, however. I mean, we need to do better. Uh, we need to, next time around, if there is a next time, and hopefully there won't be, but we prepare for it. Right, right. We need to have shorter work shifts, of course, rotate right. people in and out of there much more frequently, uh, make certain that to the best of everyone's ability and even above that, that they do wear these respirators. Now, it's impossible on the first day of a disaster like this to achieve that right. uh, because uh, they, in fact, had the best respirator. They had a self-contained breathing apparatus. But after those bottles run out in about 20 minutes, right. you know, they need new bottles. Okay. And, and we were under attack. Right, right. And it was impossible at this times of a massive attack to, to get that. But in the subsequent days where P100 uh, respirators that don't require uh, air bottles uh, could have been used, uh, we, we, we did, but we had problems, A, with supervision and B, with the design of these respirators that, that really, as I said, make it so difficult to do this work. Right. We need better designs. We need better work plans. We need to learn from this that uh, that we need to really rotate people in and out much, much faster and make certain that we are doing over and above what we should be doing to protect our work. Okay. Okay. Wow. Uh, following up on the list of individuals with possible repercussions from working in a toxic environment must be daunting. And the CDC reports that up to 400,000 New York residents might have also been exposed does your office track these individuals as well as the firefighters? No, our office is tracking the roughly 16,000 firefighters and EMS workers. I want to stress that it's both firefighters and EMS okay. workers, okay. It's right. one family. Right. But uh, that's uh, what we, we track, diagnose, treat, do annual monitoring exams on uh, for the New York City firefighters and New York City fire department EMS workers. Now, we do. 
uh, are part of a cooperative, the federal uh, World Trade Center Health Program, uh, supervised by the National uh, Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH. Mm -hmm. They are responsible for all of the people that were exposed down there. Okay. And we are just one part of that effort. We meet monthly in person and weekly by phone, if not more often, to discuss what each one of the groups is seeing so that we can function uh, as greater than the sum of our whole. Okay. Uh, we meet with sure. the survivors. We meet with uh, the other hospitals that are taking care of uh, the non-FDNY uh, 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 general responders. Uh, these are great uh, hospitals uh, that we work cooperatively with. Okay, okay. Well, and, and as you had said earlier that, um, you know, I understand that there are inherent risks in being a firefighter or, um, you know, someone with EMS, um, and that you said that there were some severe issues with, like, PTSD and things of that nature in working in this environment. But are there any other differences when someone's working in a mass casualty environment? And how does that affect their long-term health? Well, you know, in general, every time you're at a fire, every time you're at a disaster site, every time you're at a hazardous exposure site, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're, you're encountering numerous issues. Uh, if it's a fire, there's also the thermal threat uh, severe burns that can occur. Uh, thankfully, the new improvements in uh, thermal protection, uh, what firefighters call bunker gear, uh, the, the coat, the pants, mm -hmm. gloves, hood, helmet, uh, and of course the self-contained breathing apparatus, uh, they've had a phenomenal reduction in burn injuries over the course of my 30-year career. Okay, that's uh, great. Since 1996, when we've introduced this equipment, uh, burns uh, have decreased by 85% oh, wow. in the New York City Fire Department. I mean, it's that's, just amazing. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, it has totally changed it. Uh, Self-contained breathing apparatus. We used to see a lot of emphysema in firefighters when you could go back 50, 60 years ago. Right. Now we see asthma, but we don't see much emphysema. Okay. So that's uh, on a, a major advance. Oh, that's and cool. all of the other different uh, personal protection devices that we have for different hazardous exposures and the knowledge we have of these chemicals and exposures has helped us immensely. But the risks are there. Unfortunately, uh, several firefighters in our region die every year uh, and uh, from from new risks. I'm not just talking about the World Trade Center. Right, right. And throughout the country, right. uh, there are firefighters dying uh, from interior structural firefighting, from collapses, uh, and uh, lately, uh, as you've heard, from uh, wildland fires. Right, right. Uh, so this is an incredibly dangerous job. Uh, everybody else, is, they, as they always say, everybody else is running out. And Firefighters running. are running in. Right, right. And uh, it's just an amazing thing yeah. uh, to see, to witness, uh, and uh, strangers coming to your help Right. Uh, there's there's no greater feeling on the planet. Yeah, that's it. It's Absolutely. truly amazing. Right. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, Gene and I were both uh, career army officers, and in the army, after an event, we do a, a roundtable discussion, and we do lessons learned for the future, so that we can make adaptions in whatever way we need to, so that uh, sure. the future will have a better outcome. And it sounds like you're already doing that. But I was just curious, are there enough respirators in the inventory to cover events like this? Yes, there are enough respirators for our first responders. Uh, I think, you know, what the federal government has to deal with, and they are always looking at how to do this better, right. is, you know, what would happen if you had to provide aid to the general population? Okay, right, right. Uh, and that's, that's an ongoing uh, issue in Really, uh, no one knows, but there are plans and supplies stockpiled throughout the country okay. uh, so that we can do better next time and each time, as you said, learn from this and, and keep doing better. And then one other question, a follow-up. Are the respirators also keeping the firefighters from inhaling the heat or do they only stop the smoke? 
In other words, are they still getting burns as they inhale, or does it stop everything? No. So the self-contained breathing apparatus does prevent inhalation burns. Okay. Okay. Uh, because it's it's bottled air, it's cooled air. Okay, uh, good. So that that is not a problem. Good. Of course, if the SCBA runs out, right? Uh, if uh, it falls off, right? Uh, then we have problems. Right. Okay. 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 Thank you. And, and doctor, as you had said. Um, it, it takes a while, it, well, not a while, but it can take up to 20 years or so before lung cancer is, is seen. Are the emergency workers being evaluated um, on, on a regular basis now to see if they are developing lung cancer, or is there a protocol for that in place? Yes. Yeah, so we were, once again, the first uh, to start uh, annual medical monitoring of all of our World Trade Center exposed firefighters and EMS workers. Okay. We actually were able to do that starting four weeks after 9-11, oh, wow. which is an amazing yes. uh, accomplishment. Uh, and gradually, with the help of NIOSH and our hospital partners, uh, we've been expanding the things that we do so that uh, while we were doing lung cancer screening with chest CAT scans right from the very beginning, over the last three or four years, we've expanded that markedly. Uh, and uh, this is a, a, you know, a way that we can to early diagnosis and early treatment, but especially for lung cancer. Okay. The only cure for lung cancer is if it's found early. Okay. Okay. Sure. Sure. And over the years, we've learned that asbestos can do, and you know what damage that can cause. Are there other substances that firefighters are still exposed to that you wish would eventually be weeded out of the building materials industry? Well, uh, the firefighters have done a lot of research in this. I direct anybody who uh, has an interest in this to both the International Association of Firefighters uh, website, as well as the uh, NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health website. Okay. Uh, they have a list of, of chemicals that they would like uh, to get uh, out of the industry, okay. not just asbestos, uh, which is predominantly in older buildings, thankfully. Right. Uh, lead, again, sure. predominantly in older buildings. But there's a variety of fire retardants that have been of some value in, in reducing fires, uh, but now there are alternatives to that that are, are much safer in terms of a human exposure. Okay. So there's been a great interest now in trying to move to these more modern, safer uh, fire retardants. That's great okay. that they're improving constantly. Yeah, and as I was recently, I was reading an article about how they're using um, natural systems such as like, uh, they're being inspired by termites and termite structure building in reducing fire spread and keeping a building naturally cooled and possibly providing fire blocks in wilderness settings. And it's just an unusual and unique thing to use biometrics in order to prevent the spread of fires. And I find that absolutely fanc- fascinating. But yeah. um, I, was, I am curious what our listeners can do to help support their local fire de- department and firefighters and EMS. I mean, obviously, preventative steps such as smoke detectors, fire extinguishers, um, monitoring closely if you have an open flame in your home, all of those things are, are things we can all do to help, um, you know, just prevent fires and also keep everyone safe. But what else can we do to help support our local fire department and firefighters and EMS and those in New York who uh, we, you know, absolutely applaud and give our hearts to? Well, again, thank you for such a, uh, an interesting and and really uh, very insightful question because uh, we're a community and we all uh, work together to make all of us safer. Right. Uh, so, you know, clearly supporting firefighters, EMS workers, police workers, all of our first responders, and making certain that they have a livable wage oh, sure. uh, is, uh, is really the start of it okay. because we are all taxpayers and uh, our taxes need to go in a lot of directions, but we shouldn't forget these these heroes. Right. The other thing in a in a sort of safety manner is learning uh, CPR, okay. uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation techniques. They are now much easier to do. Uh, you don't uh, need to actually uh, do uh, rescue breathing. You just need to do rescue uh, percussions. Uh, the American Heart Association. Uh, has a, a website, and many other groups have the same, where you can go on and learn how to do CPR. Okay, uh, the, the way to survive a heart attack 
is uh, not to wait for EMS, but to call EMS, call your fire department, but start CPR right away. Okay, great. You've mentioned the smoke detectors. Right. Critical to not just have them, but to change the battery, the batteries once a year sure, uh, sure. during a daylight savings time is a really important time to change those batteries we, we, uh, for the ones that need batteries. Right. We actually give out uh, free batteries on Halloween in addition to candy. We give all the parents batteries as a reminder. That, that is great. Yeah. That is really great. Yeah. Uh, and then, then there are other things. There's been uh, an increase in fires from uh, candles, right. uh, both uh, religious, spiritual, uh, and uh, romantic in nature. Uh, these candles are, are great, but they, they can tip over. Uh, so you need to have a safe way to use these candles. Okay. Uh, not smoking, uh, both for its own health perspective, but also uh, falling asleep while you're smoking or carelessly dealing with uh, ashes. Right. Uh, those are ways uh, not smoking uh, can reduce fires uh, these are all very, very important things for our wildland fires. They're they're equally important. Uh, every every ash is a potential start of a fire. Okay. So good point. We we need to be cognizant of that. I think more and more we are. Uh, it's a great country. It's a great community, and and we all need to work together to achieve our lifelong pursuit of health and happiness. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Thank Excellent. you. Well, thank you for joining us today, sir. We appreciate the insight into the struggles that some are still enduring so many years after that terrible day. Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Prasant. Well, thank you for having me. Um, and, and we and, really and appreciate everything that you're doing to assist everyone, the brave men and women in New York and how that's going to affect people around the world. And it, it's just, we're really, I can't say how appreciative we are. We really, truly, we appreciate well, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you and thank you. And you'll listen to everything that they do. Okay, thank you. Have a great flight, sir. Thank you, sir. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. If our listeners have any questions or comments related to today's show, they can contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com, through our website, podcastdx.com, on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare... Please give us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. Please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regime. And never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this podcast. Until next time. Thank you much. Bye-bye.